Colleagues, uh, welcome to what promises to be a highlight of 2019 WISE, and I'm asserting that at the start. <laughs> and then you can confirm whether you believe it has been a highlight uh, as we wrap up in about an hour and 10 minutes time, but it's great to have you here. If the lights could just come up a little, uh, that would help us so that we can see each other a little more clearly. So thank you very much, that's fantastic. Um, my name is Anthony McKay. Uh, welcome to a debate. Standardised assessments are anachronistic and they hinder learning. That is the topic. It will not be quite a debate format of the kind where you might have those who are in favour of the proposition and those against, but by the end of this session together, you'll have the opportunity to hear how our remarkable panel feel about this topic, and you'll have the opportunity on two occasions to indicate how you feel about this topic. So place this within the context of the broader theme. We are here, obviously, with that overarching theme of unlearn, relearn, in so many ways to become more fully human. So ask yourself the question, to what extent do you believe standardised assessment approaches will help us to unlearn and relearn and to become more human? Now, the flow is going to be of the, of the following kind, just before I ask our esteemed colleagues to join us here. There will, not, there will be a series of prompts that I will provide to our speakers and they will indicate how they feel about various aspects of this topic. They will not reveal immediately where they stand on the proposition. Although I think it'll become pretty clear as we go through this next hour where they're leaning. But I've indicated to them that they might just keep their powder dry until quite at the end where I ask each of them to be prepared to make a very clear statement. We are also in a moment going to ask you if you'll indicate your own position on the proposition. Standardised assessments are anachronistic and hinder learning. We'll give you an opportunity to vote on that proposition in just a couple of minutes time before you experience the debate. And then at the end, after our panel have declared their positions, I'm going to ask each of you if you might vote again and let us see whether or not this session has influenced your thinking. So, with that introduction, uh, before we come to the first vote, I'm going to ask our panel if they will join me here. So, Alan and Alina, can you please come up? And also, Christine and Patton, can you please come up? Now, so people uh, feel comfortable about how they should be introduced, rather than me do that, because that's a risk, I'm going to ask each of our speakers if they will introduce themselves just briefly. So, Alan, start us off. Who are you? Um, I'm Alan Ruby. I'm a senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. I'm an Australian by background and um, have spent time uh, commenting on and uh, contributing to debates about assessment in various forms. Thank you. Alina. Um, hello. Um, I'm a high school student and I'm attending high school in Athens, Greece. I'm graduating next year and I'm here in the summit uh, because I'm part of the Learner's Voice program. So I'm here to kind of provide the student voice in this uh, debate and in my time in Athens, I spend a lot of time working with children's rights issues uh, such as sexual assault and I also work with refugees. But I also am taking the IB diploma and I'm actually sitting for my SATs next month. So this topic is very relevant for me. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings a sharp edge to today's debate. Uh, Christine, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Christine Renaud, I'm from Montreal. 
Hi to uh, good people from Montreal, because there's a lot of us here. Um, so I am the co-founder of E180, and our product is Brain Date. So you might have tried the Brain Dates here uh, during WISE. Uh, brain Dates are simply a way for human beings to learn from each other. So when you go to an event, uh, instead of, of sitting and just listening to people talking at you, you can engage with the people sitting next to you and learn from them and share your knowledge. So if you haven't done so, you can still have amazing conversations with fellow participants today at WISE, you can just come and see us downstairs. Fantastic. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, if you, Ellen, if you've got anything to promote later, you can add <laughs> to that, uh, Alina. Uh, <laughs> that was superb, thank you. Fatin. My name is Fatin Hani. I'm the director of the University of Oman Project Office. Um, my background is in strategic development, uh, strategic project development and management. And I'm here to actually hear more about how can we actually move on with the assessment and uh, in the world that we are moving into, in building a new university for science and technology for the future. How can we ensure learning for those skills or these abilities? Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, Bastis, where are you? Uh, wave to me. If you have got a microphone, we're about to give you instructions on how you will have the opportunity now to indicate uh, your position on uh, the debate topic. Uh, let me be clear. In addition to two occasions, both pre-vote and post-vote. On a couple of occasions, I'm going to come out to you so that you can contribute to this debate. Less in terms of questions to our speakers and more your own opinions. Uh, I'll ask if you can contribute those on a couple of occasions, short and sharp. Yep, and it might just be a stimulus to our speakers. So, standardised assessments are anachronistic and hindering learning, a pretty significant 70 to 30 split. So thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, let's now go to the first of uh, what will be three rounds of conversation. And Alan, let me start with you and uh, the same question to each of you. Just so we're clear about the topic under consideration, can you make it clear what you mean by standard, standardised assessments? A definition, its purpose, its applications, just so we are clear from all of you how you are thinking about uh, standardised assessments. So, Alan, start us off. I see standardised assessments as essentially a tool that generates data about an individual's progress in learning. I think there are three basic modes in which we use standardised assessments. We use them as uh, summative assessments, which allow us to make judgments about how to ration a product or to uh, sy symbolise or signify competence. We use it formatively to guide uh, learning, to provide feedback to uh, learners and to teachers. And we use it as an informative uh, tool to uh, advise stakeholders in systems about the uh, efficacy and effectiveness of a system of schooling or a nation's schooling system, and that way it has a sl an accountability function for taxpayers and uh, governments. Just let me be clear, because there are some, and others will come in on this, but just uh, so we're clear as we go through. Uh, often people understand the informative and they understand the summative. I, I understand that many people will say, ah, but you are including formative. Why? Absolutely, because formative, uh, uh, formative assessment essentially is feedback. It's feedback, and we know that feedback is one of the most crucial uh, elements in uh, promoting effective learning. And if you don't have timely feedback that is fair and consistent, learners tend to be less motivated. So form formative assessment helps the learner know their own progress and helps the instructor or teacher or digital device that's providing the learning get a feedback loop also about the effectiveness of the instruction. Yeah. Thank you. Alina. As a student, you don't really get to sit down and think about the definition of standardized assessments. You just think there are these assessments that are standardized for me, these specific ones, and that's what you limit your mind to think. So if I'm taking the SAT and the IB, I'll probably just think about these assessments. But if you really get to think about it, and I thought about this, I identified two fields that are common in all standardized assessments, and that is that one, everyone takes the same test. 
um, if it's the same assessment and everyone is scored with the same benchmarks and the same kind of way of um, being evaluated according to the test. Um, but y I also included in my mind national entry exams and many other different ways of standardized assessments that um, people tend to not think about. Um, but I think that um, the purpose of the assessments are in order to evaluate specific skills that are tested, so whether that is uh, reading in a specific amount of time or math in a specific amount of time, but it can be other skills as well. Um, but what is not clear for me as a student, and I think for students in general, is um, how, okay, so everyone gets the same test, we get the results, but then how do educators and how do other institutions as well use the results from these um, tests and how do they evaluate our skills that are given through the tests and indicated through Absolutely. the Absolutely. So the, the, the clarity of the definition, its purpose, but then its use and whether or not the use is consistent with the purpose, I think is something we want to get into to some extent. Christine, tell us, what do you think? So for me, standardized assessment um, is, is a way to, to measure uh, impact of, uh, as Alan said, uh, education system teaching. Um, so the question for me uh, is probably not about if standardized assessment is relevant or not. For me, the real question is what are we testing? And are we testing the right thing? Um, and when I think about the competencies, the skills, the values uh, that we need in today's society and in the future, I'm thinking about the creativity, compassion, the ability to navigate uncertainty, the ability to self-direct your own learning. Uh, and this is the fluffy stuff that never gets evaluated. But if we want to build, renew our vision of education systems that will um, deeply, um, sorry, <laughs> deeply, uh, deeply value and, and promote uh, those those sets of, of skills and competencies um, we do need to to also measure if we're if we're able to um, to get those benefits and get those impact uh, by by measuring teaching and curriculum so for me standardized assessment is less about measuring uh, the children to give them feedback about their own progression but rather to ask ourselves are we serving uh, our children the way we should uh, and our curriculum and teachers performing the way they should regarding those that set of skills that I think we should focus on in, in redefining what education is. So let me just be clear because yeah. that means therefore that with the multiple purposes that you are identifying for assessment in order to get, as you say, to the, the very areas of knowledge and skills and dispositions that you want to, you would see standardised assessments as being one form and a narrow form. Is that what you're saying? It's a narrow form of assessment? Well, it's, it's big data. It's, yeah. a, it's a way to get information, for me, not that much on the students themselves, but more on the performance uh -huh. of us as educators and right. system. But what I would say is that we're now measuring something that is not serving our children. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Fat, thank you. Um, so I come from the world of the higher education. Um, to me, uh, the standardized assessments is a way to measure uh, uh, students' abilities or aptitude or um, knowledge in a certain area. And um, in our world where um, in Sultanate of Oman, the right to education is guaranteed to all at both levels, low, uh, K to 12 or higher education. And at the same time, the government supports uh, the education entering higher education, but obviously cannot basically pay for all the students that come out of school. So you have about 45,000 students coming out of high school and mm -hmm. you can't take them all into um, higher education. So there should be a scientific sub uh, objective way that assesses who those who can and to us um, the standardized assessment serves that purpose in helping actually kind of screen those who can be um, who can access uh, higher education uh, institutions um, and and in terms of the standardized assessments it's basically very good um, as you can see and we use it when we want to uh, have a screening process or an objective process of actually selecting uh, people based on their abilities or their scores in certain areas but also so it is a challenge because it's not necessarily measuring certain other areas or measuring the development. So as an entry point, I think it's working, but as a continuous performance measure, 
it's having some challenges and probably we'll talk about it more. Okay, let, let me um, take you to uh, a proposition that we'll get a little deeper into the conversation. And uh, at the end of this round, I'm going to come out to our participants and make sure that you have the opportunity to contribute. But uh, let me put this proposition to you, Patton, if I can start with you. This is about arguing that standardised assessments are anachronistic and hinder learning. So I want to get into the territory of why the argument is that standardised assessments now have lost their traction, they are now hindering learning, not just that they contribute some part to it, and there are many other forms of assessment that will help us, but even further than that. So, the language that I'm hearing increasingly in the debates around this is that assessment needs to be thought of in ways that promote learning for the individual, where whatever the area of knowledge, the discipline or the skills, we are increasingly understanding that this is developmental. We think about learning progressions. All young people are at very different points in any classroom in many of our countries. As early as uh, midway through primary years, elementary years, we can have three, four years difference in cognitive development. So let's be clear about what we mean as developmental progression in learning in each of the areas that we wish to test. And then let's be clear that we want to make sure that the assessment is appropriate to help us to identify where young people are in relation to that. Not in relation to other kids, right, but in relation to a developmental continuum. And formative assessment, going back to Alan's point, surely now takes on a different meaning here because it is very much feedback to the individual student and to teachers, and you then can determine how you intervene and how you move them in terms of their learning. So surely standardised assessment, given that purpose for assessment, is anachronistic and hinders learning. What's your view? You, you have actually said it in, in the way you have laid out the statement. It, it is actually hindering learning. And I will take it again from the higher education point of view at the starting point. I have been in, at some time in my career where we're recruiting students for MBA, executive MBA. And some of these are directors who have had 20 or plus years as a board member, as a head of finance, as a CFO. And the minute, and they are keen and they want to study, and the minute they need to do a GMAT or a GRE, they say, I'm not doing that. So that's hindering learning at the point of entry to a certain program. The other thing is that we are not in an ideal world, unfortunately. So there are still a lot of education institutions that for the sake of them performing better or looking like they are doing better or certain governments to show that they are actually showing results, really teach just for the assessment. And uh, to Elena's point, I mean, is that really actually then giving them the learning or are they are just actually learning to how to pass the test? So in a way, yes, it does. And also the other thing is I like very much formative assessments, and that's how it should be. But not all of the current standardized assessments are actually formative. I'll share a little experience. I'm almost 50 years old, and because I am an Arab origin and I wanted to do a higher degree, I had to do an IELTS to access an international university. My niece, who's 16, and next year will start applying to universities, will be doing IELTS. We're both doing IELTS academics, and we're being assessed exactly in the same way. How is that right? Thank you. Um, I, do, I do believe that, um, that uh, standardized assessment are hindering learning. Um, and uh, I forgot to mention that actually I'm a teacher by trade, so I'm an entrepreneur now, but I, I did my master's at, at Harvard at a moment where No Child Left Behind was being implemented. Uh, and I'm actually also starting a school right now. So the question of how do you measure uh, progress uh, is definitely very dear to my heart. Um, I think there's many things, and again, um, standardized testing, the way that we know them are uh, actually measuring knowledge acquisition and retention. And I think that it's something that we hear, uh, hear a lot is that in this day and age, you, we don't need to acquire knowledge the way we did uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what we need right now is to help children and an adult to learn to be self-directed in their learning. We need to help them to navigate uncertainty. We need to help them to uh, find creative answers to problems that don't exist 
exist. Knowledge acquisition is not anymore what the education system should be thinking about. So, but when that's what you measure, that's what the teachers will focus on. That's what they will be evaluated on. Um, so I think that hinders what learning should be today. And that's, I think, why we're all here is that we're trying to figure out what will learning mean? Uh, I mean, what does it mean today and what will it mean in the upcoming years? Um, and even given that, when you see what's happening in schools and you have the concept, and I don't know how it is in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, but I know in the United States, less in Canada, that you have this concept of you have green students and, and yellow students and red students. And eventually what happens is that while you focus on the green and the yellow students, the, peop the, the students that are succeeding or could succeed, because that will be that will look good on your teacher's profile, but the red ones, and of course it's not all teachers, but the red ones will fall behind because they're kind of lost so already we're deciding at the level of primary secondary education that some children are not worth paying attention to uh, and I think if that's not hindering learning I don't know what, what that is thank you um, Alina this is going to be fascinating because uh, you are experiencing a form of standardized assessment uh, in an SAT but then you look at the multiple forms of assessment within IB so the question is as you think about these forms of assessment is the standardized version seriously hindering your learning. Okay, so I would like to address uh, two views accor uh, according to this um, proposition, let's say. So one would be if we address the content that is being tested right now and then the content that should be tested or maybe some content that needs to be, that needs to be changed. So I think that if we take standardized assessments as of now, the test itself, it's not the issue, but the way that it's approached and the way that it is taught is the thing that hinders the learning. Because um, there are many different ways. So everyone is given the same test, especially if we take international programs. Everyone takes the same test, but the way they're going to get to that finish line is very different. So um, a culture that is very prominent right now is that teachers are administering the information and the skills that students need to use in order to excel in the assessments in a very restricted way in that they only focus on that because that's the only thing that we have time for. It's the only thing that they can afford to address because, well, I think time is uh, what everyone wants in standardized assessments. Everyone's running out of time. Uh, and so um, the issue is that the test itself does not hinder the learning, but if teachers only take into account what needs to be taught and they don't address other skills that need to be built or other learning outcomes that need to be achieved that surpass standardized testing, then that becomes a problem because standardized testing does have uh, certain skills that are taught that are beneficial like time management, stress management, and thinking quickly on your feet because you're getting problems that you need to solve in, a, in a, an efficient manner. But then there are other um, skills like empathy or um, thinking critically that are not addressed. And even in, let's say, IB, where there are different topics and there's many different ways of assessment, um, everyone at the end of the day needs to do the same thing and everyone needs to look at the girl last year that got a seven and let's just copy her work because we need that seven. And then if we address the content that needs to be taught, um, Still, a lot of content in standardized assessments are relevant. Like, I feel if you want to go into civil engineering, you should be able to learn and solve efficiently foundational math problems like um, equations of lines or some calculus problems. You need that because otherwise, well, if you make a bridge, it's going to fall and no one really <laughs> wants that. Um, but there are other um, points of views in even civil engineering, let's say, that you need to address in standardized testing. You need to address a lot of critical thinking. You need to address the empathy because at the end of the day, you don't want to have um, a machine that's giving you the problems and the answers. You want to have a person yeah. behind that. Thank you. Thank solution. you. Ellen, can you stir us up a bit, please? So um, <laughs> I think the, the problem here is <coughs> I don't hear a lot of opposition to standardised. We standardise things for fairness, to treat people who are in the same population, doing the same course, aspiring for the same uh, credential fairly. So we give them roughly the same test. And there's nothing wrong with assessment. Assessment is the, is the, is the tool that provides feedback which encourages 
people to improve their practice as instructors and learners to improve their learning and why they learn and how they learn and when they learn. So the problem's not so much with standard assessment, standardised assessment. The problem is with the nature of the content and the timing and structure of the tests. We don't use teamwork in the SAT, but we should look at capacity for testing, people's capacity for teamwork, because in the future, life is about teamwork, whether we like it or not. I recently had a student who wasn't keen on what he called group work, and I had to break it to him that his career aspiration was for a life of group work. And so we need to think more critically about the content of what's in standardised assessment because we want the fairness. We test, we we'll use standardised assessments sometimes because we want timely and quick results because the sooner you get the feedback, the sooner you'll learn. And how do we do that? We do it by standardising the items and standardising the type of items and limiting the number of items. Yet. You've all talked about the complexity. You've heard nothing but about the complexity of the future for the last two days. We've talked about the ambiguity of the future for the next two days. We've talked about, for the last two days, we've talked about teamwork and collegiality and community building for the last two days. Now, they are what should be in standardised assessments. I don't think the problem is with standardised assessments. It's the problem with the content of the assessment and the nature of the assessment items. Just before I come to people in the room, let me just give you a kind of right of reply here. There's nothing wrong with standardised assessments, right? It's the content, right? It's what we privilege, yeah? And, by the way, standardised assessments ensure, at least in some terms, that there's fairness. Correct, Alan? That's the argument, yeah? What's your reaction? Well, I, um, that was my, my opening remarks yep. were about exactly this this point. Um, and I would I would add, though, that... Um, I think there's the content, and I do believe also uh, it's about the, the usage of the results because I do not feel and believe that the test results are meant to help a child grow. Uh, I think it's meant to categorize people and decide who will uh, move further and who won't. Um, and I think that's how it's perceived by children. So, you know, I, I wish it was meant to give direction again to teachers, help us to realign curriculum, help us to serve kids better. It was seen as a way to measure progress and also based on what the children want to, to, to learn. But, but it's not the case. It's, it's seen as a pass or, or failure, and failure is not something we embrace in schools right now. Right. Yeah, please do, yeah. Right. yeah but, but have a go at Ellen if you could. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I could, let me just encourage you, yeah? I, I'm sorry to disappoint. I actually <laughs> tend to agree with Alan. He put it very eloquently. It, the, the issue is not the standardized assessments or the concept of having a standardized assessment. This is basically probably the only way that you ensure fairness yeah. and equality and providing at least equal opportunity to everybody that is participating. It's in the way uh, it is designed. It's in the way it's managed. It's in the way the whole system then actually builds around it and becomes commercial. It becomes focused on uh, only the result actually and actually praising those who make it and demoralizing those who don't make it. And in a lot of uh, the places in our part of the world at least, the fault is always the, chil the child's fault. Mm -hmm. And that comes to them from the teachers, from the school and from the parents. So uh, what is the role of the teachers here? How are the teachers part of how bad the assessment of the child or the uh, student is actually? So yes, I agree. It's about um, how it can be reformed as a system to ensure it is agile enough with the vast changes of and the ambiguity that is yet to come actually in how the world is actually unfolding and the complexity of things and how can we have streamlined assessment that can actually assess more than one thing because there are tools to do that. I mean, why not SAT have a team uh, measure as well? Why not, um, I don't know, other, uh, other standardized assessment have things that are related to cognitive uh, uh, skills to the 21st century skills that Christine referred to in terms of, um, you know, solution oriented, thinking out of the box and creative and all of these other things. Okay. Um, I'm holding on to the proposition that standardised assessments are anachronistic and that they hinder learning. I'm hearing quite a number of qualifications to that where you would actually potentially change the proposition in order to accommodate 
uh, a number of the points that you've made. But we are not going to change the proposition, uh, even though we're going to be obviously having a debate about meaning here. So uh, let me come to you. Um, contributions, if I can get microphones to the two at the back here and a couple at the front. Can I ask that each contribution is literally a minute? Yep, otherwise I'm going to be in trouble getting around the room. One, two, okay. And just um, introduce yourself, yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Whitby. I'm a, a, an educator of 40 years. Um, my experience with standardized tests is that they are not standard. You can't um, remove culture, uh, the idea of poverty, personal experiences from kids when they take a test. Uh, the, the kids who um, come from families with, with a lot of literature within the, the, the home, uh, travel experience, they're going to view that test differently than kids of poverty. So, so there is no standardized test. And as far as skills go, most of these tests are based on content, not skills. If you want to test skills, you go to portfolio assessment. It makes a lot more sense because you can see what <coughs> skills the kid has and, and the proof is, is there. A standardized test is just a promise of potential. Portfolio is, is proof of concept. Thank you. Here. Is that my minute? That's your minute. Thank okay. you. Can you pass that across? Thank you. And Hi, my name is Hassan and Renan an uh, at Tech Company. My comment on standardized testing is we should look at it from its cultural context. It was designed for a time, for an age, and I think we don't we no longer need it in this time of personalization when your book selection, your shopping can be customized and personalized. Why can't we personalize assessment? So instead of supporting the idea of assessment and then talking about to just change the content, I think we should just you know, look at this holistically and understand where it came from and do we still need it. Thank you. Please. And just introduce yourself. And we're getting back to, yeah, right here. Thank you. And it's now 45 seconds. Okay. Okay. My name is Zara. I'm from Armenia and I'm an active teacher. Uh, I think with all of this debate, we need to look at um, the question that the world hasn't come with the better tool of comparing the acquisition of factual knowledge, skills, and what so, uh, then some sort of assessment. You say word assessment, in my particular uh, experience, kids start competing. Kids start competing, they start cheating, they start preparing for the test, whatever that does, that improves the factual knowledge, but we are lacking on the skill development. Now, whether it's, the question is, are we already, when the student comes to Harvard, giving them an individual test that will test or somehow assess his or her factual knowledge plus ability to self-navigate, yes. learn through the problem, and show you the ability of combine all of this in a teamwork manner or whatever. Can you imagine the amount of the work that we as an educator or for, for, for future employers and stuff, we all talk big, but when we talk the reality, come up with the better uh, Thank skin. you, thank you. <coughs> to the back. Hi, yes, um, my name's Matthew McGregor Stubbs. I'm a research director in assessment, so I'm slightly biased on this one, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, I just wanted to make a few points, which is that Absolutely, at times, uh, standardized assessments lead to curriculum narrowing, but I think there's a broader point there that assessments don't operate independently. They're part of a wider ecosystem. So really, you need to be looking at your curriculum alongside your assessment mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to comment on the idea that uh, 21st century skills are never assessed in standardized assessments, well, they are in some countries, but it comes back to what you've put as the content of your curriculum. Um, and I think that's a really important point to emphasise. Thank you. I've got time for two more, and I'll go here and then here. Okay, sorry, and others I'll bring in next round. Okay? Okay, I'm a <coughs> Neil, a small school principal, I'll give you very quick bullet points. One thing I want to separate out straight away is the difference between assessment and testing. We, we, we're muddling those things up, they're completely different. The other one, I think, is power, who owns an assessment. I'm very happy with criteria and referencing, but as soon as we have a standardized test, what is the methodology, who designed it, and, and why? And what I want to see is the alignment of pedagogy purpose, assessment, and evaluation. And in there, all I want to say is, my job was destroyed by the wrong forms of assessment applied for the wrong reasons. Thank you. 
good morning. That's Kesel Matima from South Africa, a lifelong scholar of note. He almost stole, uh, stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is that uh, who then assesses the assessor and moderates? Because now it brings into focus the issues of subjectivity. Yeah. yeah. Who assesses the assessor? Like uh, the other colleague mentioned there that uh, perceptions of poor children and those that come from privileged backgrounds will be much more different. They won't see things the same. So now if uh, the assessor is much more in terms of culture skewed towards those that are privileged, obviously it's going to be more sympathetic to those kids when assessing. Thank you. Thank you. Let me do one more. Yep, go. Hello, my name is Court. Hello, my name is Courtney Randall. I'm with QF Park Foundation International. You use the microphone. Oh. Yep. And one of my points are, well, I have a few points, but um, I believe that standardized testing, it is like a standard category. It does not incorporate the different learning styles, which is very important when testing students. There are multiple ways to test without having a paper test. And with all of this project-based learning, I believe that that should be really um, incorporated and considered when testing from any age range, from young to adult. Thank you. I'm just reminded of our wise winner, Larry, and the way in which that video was highlighting the importance of project-based learning, performance assessments, the way in which you actually give account to a public. Yeah, as it a all goes back to the 21st century learning skills. Yeah. So it implies that we need to change the whole style. Thank you. OK. So, uh, colleagues, having heard that, and no doubt being influenced by it, uh, <laughs> let me bring you to uh, a second proposition here, um, and then again we'll come out for further comment. Let me argue that standardised assessments are anachronistic, and they hinder learning, and quite frankly they're going to become irrelevant. In an age of AI and related technologies, when you think about the way in which we'll be able to assist people in their learning, particularly through augmented forms that affect everything from language to sensory, the way in which this is now already starting to manifest itself in tools that are on the marketplace already, the learning analytics that are being developed off the back of big data sets and small data sets, the shift toward potentially peer-to-peer -peer learning and the way in which I might be able to ensure that the robo-revolution can really help me in the way in which I go about my learning and assist me to actually progress. Quite frankly, standardised assessments are just inadequate for that kind of world. So, Alan. Um. I'm more worried about the narrowing effects and the standardizing effects of the algorithms behind artificial intelligence than I am about standardized tests or standardized assessments. Because what underlies an artificial intelligence is a set of formulas. And they're very, very formulaic. Yes, they're very complex. Yes, they're able to do with fuzzy systems. Yes, they've got many, many qualities but they are more, much more narrowing than the traditional liberal arts education, which is subject and amenable to standardised assessment, even if it means using a portfolio with a standard rubric. So I'm much more sceptical about the liberating power of artificial intelligence. I'm very worried it's going to be constraining and will, in fact, reinforce the toxic parts of the standardised testing that many of you have referenced. That is, uh, just be clear here, because I think that distinction between assessments and testing, uh, the toxic elements of this that you would like to see eliminated are? Oh, the stupidly hard question that's buried in the mathematics paper that every kid is going to fail. <laughs> Excuse me? Why? Well, because it's good for research. Well, do research. Don't drop it into the assessment regime. Um, that uh, I'm very sceptical about uh, time-limited tests because life is not time-limited. Yeah, right. Well, as I get older, I realise that it is, but um, 
you, you understand the point. <laughs> I do. So the specifications here are really important. Yes. Right, okay. Elena, tell us, uh, this is actually your world. You're going to be shaping this, and you will be harnessing the power of technology to support your learning. So quite frankly, standardised assessments for you, well, they might have a role, but it'll be pretty limited. Okay, so even though I do live in this world, I want to say that I'm not a very AI, um, you know, and tech related person. I don't engage in it that much. But um, I think I want to bring in kind of the more general topic that we've been addressing these days um, in the summit specifically of what it means to be human. And yesterday I attended a discussion where um, we really, uh, they really discussed the knowing, doing, and feeling that uh, a lot of, uh, well, we do as humans, but uh, AI, we're trying to achieve AI to do that as well. So they're in the knowing, now they're in the doing, but we can never really get to the feeling. And um, in, in order to relate this to standardized assessments, so standardized assessments i feel like the ones that are still not updating their content and they're not really um getting used to including content that is relevant now with all the new technology and all the new skills that need to be tested it's it's still the same content that was tested before all of these technologies were relevant and so um i think the the content and the ones that are not updated that is irrelevant but if we kind of embrace um, the technology within the standardized assessment, maybe having standardized assessments or technology use, that would be very beneficial. But again, it would I, I feel like it has to be still narrowed down to only people that are interested in that. Um, and then not limiting only them. And I feel like if we take the route of uh, really including skills that are taught with technology in the standardized assessments, whether that is testing or assessments, um, we still need to find a way to also assess other skills that are not technology related because we still need to be aware of what it means to be human and we need to be aware that there are skills that humans have that artificial intelligence will never have, such as arts or humanities. And I feel very passionate in that subject. So I feel that in standardized assessments right now and in the emerging world, that is kind of put second and uh, I really don't want that to be second. Thank you. Christine, this is your territory. Yeah, it's, I, I thought the question was really interesting, and I think I, I need to make something clearer for, for my uh, my emerging uh, position, um, that indeed I think we're not testing the right thing, and I also think we're not teaching the right thing. So I totally agree with uh, the monsieur talking about, uh, you know, the, like exactly that point in terms of curriculum. Um, I think we need a major overhaul of what education means. And when, when uh, I think about it, I always think about a John Dewey who said uh, education shouldn't be a preparation for life, it's life itself. Um, so how can we create an educational system where children and adults are not learning in a waterfall model where you learn, you apply, you learn, you apply, it's agile. As an entrepreneur, I didn't do an MBA. I, I've, I've learned doing, mistake, surrounding myself by great people, getting guidance, and then trying again. It's, it's something that is very alive. Um, so in that sense, for me, when I think about um, standardized uh, assessment and, and big data, um, I do believe when you launch a social enterprise like I did, you need a strong theory of change. You need a strong uh, impact uh, measuring impact assessment model. And for me, what we call now um, standardized assessment could become a way once we start and as we start doing this overhaul of education and, and implementing new ways that we've never tried on a massive scale, self-directed learning, community-based learning, but on a massive educational global scale, well, is it working? Are we doing it? And it is working. We know that's how people learn. But are we doing it the right way as educators? Are we having the right curriculums? Is our way of doing self-directed learning and community-based learning and project-based learning and real-life-based learning, is it, are we doing it the right way? And that's what assessment will bring as data, as I said before, it's often like the fluffy stuff doesn't get tested. And we need to know as educator, are we serving our children correctly? So for me, the big data part, standardized assessment is big data, is providing big data. And we need big data to know if we're succeeded or not at, at, at education revolution. So I would just think about it as impact assessment in terms of like standardized assessment. So therefore, just be clear about your school my school. The language that you're going to use around assessment could easily include 
as Ellen has said, both the use of the word standard and assessment, but you'd be making it clear what the purpose is. Exactly. And when you think about, again, like impact studies, it is an assessment and it is standardized. It's, it's, it's science, you yeah. know, like it's scientific. You need standards when you evaluate scientifically something. Yeah. But what we're evaluating, that, that is what it is in need of major overhaul. Uh, well, we could easily get into a debate because before we talked about curriculum and pedagogy and assessment and reporting and evaluation. So which territory are we really in here? Yeah, I, don't, I don't want to muddy I the waters help too with much. That. Yeah, so this is uh, another way of getting into the it. debate. Yeah, Fatten, help us here. Let me be, I want to push this point though, sure. that surely I can understand that we still need data sets and we still might want to be able to test in order to gather data that gives us information about the efficacy of particular pedagogical approaches in impacting learning. I get that. but. This is standardized assessments as we currently think of them are anachronistic and they're going to hinder learning in a way which AI and related technologies and the way in which I'm increasingly thinking about how we can have peer-to-peer -peer learning that's really powerful. Surely the argument is that standardized assessment do not really feature well in a new emerging landscape for learning, personalized learning. What's your position? I agree with that statement. You're absolutely right. So uh, y the world of artificial intelligence is not far away. It's already happening. We yeah. are living it. Yeah. And if I will not talk about how the future will be, which, because it's very ambiguous, and we're all thinking about how the future will look like and how do we address this issue. But I'll talk even about now. So a lot of the standardized assessment at the moment are actually measuring skills of memorizing things, ability to do arithmetic skills, ability to, for example, um, um, spell right right, English right, for example, and so on, or whatever the language may be. The artificial intelligence at the moment are doing that. So if you are a lawyer now and you wanted to actually write about a case and usually you would research all the relevant cases that are relevant to this. Now at the press of a button, the robot will actually get you all the cases. But what you will need as a lawyer then is a different skill is actually how do you read that analysis and analyze it and then present it. So I'll go to Elena's point actually. What we will need to focus on is that the standardized assessment will still be required. You will need a way of assessing people. Otherwise, how would you know where they are or where they stand or where the system and or what the performance uh, looks like? But the content and the way it will be will be different and will have to be more personalized, more tailored. And it will have to be more tailored to give you not just a stand position of, okay, the score, but then feedback of how can you, you know, enhance it. And uh, I think it will be also, m it will have to be more comprehensive that actually measures the student, the teacher, the system, and so you'd actually be able to pinpoint exactly where the problem is. I went on a tangent, but I think actually it is all about the, uh, the skills that will be assessed will be different, so the assessment will have to change to measure the right skills for the future and for the artificial intelligence and not the traditional assessments that we have at the moment. Okay, so I just want to push Alan on a point here. And it comes um, to, your, to your point about getting a seven, yeah? Let's argue that in a couple of years' time, the notion of that kind of score of whatever kind that we generate at the end of secondary education for particular purposes around selection and entry into highly competitive faculties within universities, which frequently drive assessment systems within jurisdictions at the moment. And let's just say that is coming to an end. That kind of process is not the way in which we're thinking about multiple learning pathways for young people. The idea that, in fact, I have to wait till the end of secondary education to be accessing other forms of learning, I'll be building my portfolio over a period of time. And so this notion of aid grade relationship will have actually have gone. And this is liberating. This means that the kind of standardised assessments we have currently at the most senior level of secondary education will disappear. And people will be able to pursue their own learning pathways. What's your judgment about that and how much will that serve fairness and equity? Um, <clears throat> the gentleman who uh, reminded us that there's a cultural and economic basis to testing really makes the point that the, the more you rely on those sorts of measures, the, that, that, that relationship between grades and class and attractiveness and and uh, poverty race will continue I don't have any doubt about that but to go to your first the heart of your question 
the elite universities of the world don't use grades, haven't used grades for uh, 40 years probably. They've been judging by completely different portfolios for assessment. And we were talking about what we might use for the University of Amman entry for the new university, brand new, the university of the future. They're not going to use grade point average. They're going to use a portfolio of, of assessments and probably an interview. The, pro the difficulty with those models is that fairness, equity, minimising corruption get a lot harder and you need to have a much higher trust in your society and between your social institutions if you're going to have these much more sophisticated ways of assessing people or selecting people for what is a ration good. Okay, let's open it up. Uh, five minutes. Uh, people can uh, put their positions. So let me go here to begin with. So I can get a microphone right there. And the second over here. Okay, thank you. Just say who you are. Hi, uh, my name is Nara, and I'm also a Learner's Voice Program Fellow, and uh, I'm currently a junior at Northwest University here in Qatar. And what I wanted to emphasize was kind of how I took the ACT, obviously I did the IB as well, I went to university, but the funny part was when I got to university, all of those grades really didn't matter. I got there and I was like, does that 42 on IB matter? No, I didn't get one, but... That's beyond the point. You should have. Um, but I was also studying stuff at school that really did not apply to my current major. And I think I used a lot of like portfolio um, items for the university to accept me. Um, so I wanted to talk about how using these skills that we learn in SATs or ACTs or any other standardized assessments later on in university life or like beyond university, how do they apply? So I think I wanted to emphasize the importance of EQ is what I like emotional like intelligence in general when I got to university I thought was more important than even like my intelligence in terms of like subjects was I able to like relate to people did I have empathy was I able to work in groups so I think these tests should be testing those kind of things so that you're able to re like learn in a diverse environment when you're done with like thank you over tests. here yeah. yes hi um, my name is Muntasir I work for BRAC education program which is the largest secular non-formal education provider in the world. Yes. So our experience is um, standardized test is actually discriminatory in some sense. I, I have to make that point uh, because we are talking about fairness, ensuring fairness through it. But see, the students from non-formal sector, the goal is to integrate them, them uh, at a later stage into the formal sector. And that is being done through a standardized test. But the socioeconomic context and the curriculum and the need, everything of this disadvantaged group of children are different. So it becomes, they drop out. They don't progress because they cannot pass these uh, standards tests. So I want to have a segue into AI because one point we miss about AI is its self-learning system. So if we feed them enough data, it can actually learn by itself to personalize the assessment. So we can actually ensure fairness through AI as well. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. I'm Ditaba Gontoy. I come from Lesotho, is in Southern Africa. I work with the Examinations Council of Lesotho. So I'm very much biased towards standardized assessments. But I think when I look at the topic, I, I thought it, it had a meaning. And that meaning is that it's like assessment is stagnant. Assessment is not stagnant. After all, educational goals are changing. They're continuously changing. And as educational goals change, the curriculum would change. And assessment has to respond as such. And as we look, more, we look into the future, and we are looking at um, uh, OI, we should remember that we are thinking of MOOC today this, the school without walls. And if you're thinking of the school without walls, assessment has to respond accordingly. And that is what is happening in assessment because assessment is a science. It goes along with the changes that are happening in Thank education. You. Thank you. Please. Okay. Uh, my name is Mehdi Sharif. I'm a sociology student from Tunisia. Um, a quick point, first of all, uh, we, there's been a conflation between different notions, different understandings of what assessment is and standardized testing is etc so that might have complicated the debate a, a little bit secondly my point is about the um, the use of the results of standardized testing that 
uh, quasi systematically hijack the educational debate and that make it very hard to to uh, to reform education in a sense because people will only focus on the on the numbers and that's one of the reasons my country for example isn't uh, has interrupted its participation in pisa this year in the pisa assessment because the media only focus on the the rank and the score and that leaves out a whole part of the conversation around education reform thank you it's very important to <coughs> assess innovation Assessments is not only hindering learning, but it's also hindering innovation. I'm in the Ministry of Education in Qatar, and we're always asked by universities to stress on project-based learning, hands-on activities, but they are preaching something they're not doing because by the end of the day when they select, they select by the grade. So they keep asking us to do things. So this is hindering educators because we are working to build progressive schools, innovative schools. We're working with the students to build some competences and by the end of the day, they are not tested on these competence. They are tested in a different set of com uh, competences and sets. This is one thing. So. I believe it could be the uh, job of every university and every people who have a career to build their own assessment. And by assessment, we mean to interview the person and to see and assess his own potential. Are, is this person or is this a student have the potential to become a doctor? or an engineer. It's very absurd to know that, uh, a the, for example, the medical schools, they take students who are very good in math and they don't take biology. In th this is something that we really think very deeply about. So it is the uh, importance of every university to design its own sort of filtration. Okay. Thank you. Yes. My name is Mohamed Abu Zainab. I own a company that has trainers that does licensed regional brain training that's cognitive, social, as well as physiological training, so you actually get into the body too. Um, just for the sake of inclusion, uh, we noticed the definition of standard assessments doesn't say standard assessments now, it just says standard assessments, so it's very specific, the question. But learning, who's the learner? So my question is, why haven't we spoken about teachers yet? They're learning from this too, right? So uh, when a teacher reads an assessment, let's say in our ideal future, where we find out that the student is actually not a non-sequential learner, oh, teacher says, I gotta learn a new skill because I gotta relate to this student. And another teacher says, oh, this, th this new assessment from the future says, oh, this, this student learns spatially and this other teacher learns numerically. Oh, I gotta learn to work with space with this student and I gotta learn to work numerically with another student. The learner never stops with the student. The learner is always the teacher too. We have to actually re-educate re the culture of what it is to be a teacher that you're never a teacher. You don't talk down knowing more. You're learning just like the people in front of you. Yeah. Thank you. So colleagues, with all of the limitations of the debate, yes, uh, and the fact that we began with a set of definitions that we then continued to qualify uh, in order to be able to, I think, make ourselves feel that this is a very rough kind of statement to say yes or no to. But given all of those qualifications and the hesitations and the shortcomings, I'm now going to ask each of you to declare where you stand on this, that standardised assessments are anachronistic and they hinder learning. And on balanced judgement, are you going for or against, and you've only got 30 seconds with a statement that might explain your vote. So, please start us off. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Um, I agree and disagree with this statement. <laughs> I'm not going to take a stand position. I'll have to dissect it. Yes. So I agree that uh, the standardized is actually. Assessment is not, with a caveat that it will have to be tailored and it will have to be adaptive and actually change with the complexity and the changes that are happening in the world. Like everything else in the world, we were in an era we were, we era we were standardizing everything and treating people as masses and treating processes as masses and industry as masses. That world is changing to become more tailored and more individual. I'll borrow from this morning's actually speech of the Mozambique yes. uh, um, uh, ex-minister who said we had to go to door to door. And in here, we will have to go to student to student, learner, learner, or whatever it may be. Perfect. Thank you, Fadden. Christine? 
I would go, I, I evolved. I was about to say like, uh, I'm kind of in between, but it's a, I'm thinking about the word anarchy. And anarchy is a political system, but it also means chaos in a lot of minds. So people don't really use the word anarchy anymore yeah. because we don't really know what it means. So I will just say that for me, and I want history to remember me as saying that. And that's <laughs> why I'm going to vote uh, that I agree with the sentence that standardized assessment, as uh, you said, uh, as we know them now, uh, they are anachronistic and they hinder learning. And I think, Madame, uh, you, your point was uh, delicious, uh, I would say, because indeed, when we think about innovation in schools as not coming from the top down, but from the grassroots level, the communities, the teachers, well, if we're blocked by what we need to be teaching for the test, then that innovation can never grow. So in that sense, I think the sentence is Thank right. you very much, Alina. And you have one minute, Maxim. Okay. I feel like the idea of having a standardized assessment in place is something that is very much needed, especially because we have all these cultural differences and because we all come from different backgrounds. So everyone, if we, we, if we want to evaluate everyone in a fair way, there needs to be a set standard uh, in specific institutions, let's say, or in a specific filter that people need to cover in order to get in. But right now, the what is being tested and how it is being approached in order to be tested is what is anachronistic and is what limits learning. And I feel like a solution for this is not to, because we said that in, in college you don't have this anymore, but in high school you do. And that is something that is very contradictory because you don't have this in pre-JK, but you have it in high school again. I feel like the change needs to start from the pre-JK. And if we teach them that you don't, because your whole life and my whole life from pre-JK has been building up to high school, exams, university, and then I'm free. <laughs> but <laughs> why should I be free until high school, go through four years of slavery, and then be <laughs> free again? So we need to kind of eradicate the notion of Freedom, slavery, and then freedom, and just kind of provide the freedom uniform all Beautiful. throughout. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, <coughs> I agree with my younger friend here about <laughs> the very first part of the standardised as assessment piece, which she said much more eloquently than I will ever say. I just have to break it to her that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the freedom after, grad, after your bachelor's degree uh, can be a little narrow um, and a little volatile and can be taken from you. And the final point, uh, and should be resisted to the people who wish to take it from you, you should resist them. And I, I encourage you in that and I know that you will do that as from our conversations. The other thing to say is that the assessment uh, business has got a lot more sophisticated in the last 20 years yeah. than, it w than it was when the SAT got developed for the first time in 1936 or something. Yeah. And uh, medical admissions tests have got much more sophisticated than just given in the math test. Let me assure you, I have this conversation with every general practitioner which is, where did you do your training? Can I check your test mature? Where did you do your in-service? How much practice did you do? What was your initial degree? And by the end, they're like, why are you asking this? Because I don't trust you. <laughs> because I, if you were just chosen off the math test, sorry, I've got all this biology inside me and not a lot of math. <laughs> but, so, but understand that there are much more sophisticated assessment tools and, and y there is some hope for the, for better at improving things. But I think the statement of the day is, is, El, uh, is Alina's, and I, I thank her for it. Thank you, Alan, very much. Okay, brilliant. Uh, well, thank, thank you. I'm going to thank you again in a moment, but the, it's not done, okay? Uh, you now, on the basis of all that you've heard, um, and you may well have been more persuaded by what you said yourself than whatever, whatever you heard from our speakers, um, that was not meant to be disrespectful. I just think that people will have their own views about this and I understand entirely the limitations uh, of this statement. But can you have your devices ready, please? Because we are going to ask you to re-vote on the basis of the debate that we've had or the dialogue that we've had. And so you're either voting yes or no to the proposition that standardised assessments are anachronistic and hinder learning.
can you please get your devices ready and we will be happy to receive votes as of now. So please start to vote and let's check the pre and the post and you remember that the pre was 70% in favour of the motion and 30% opposed. Let's make sure that we get at least the same sample size. So we need more people to vote. Thank you. And it'd be great if the people who didn't vote in the pre-vote can now add their voices. We won't actually ask the question about whether in fact that invalidates the vote on the basis that we've got a different sample. <laughs> but keep on going. Let's see if we can get a few more registered. Once we get a couple of others locked in here uh, and we get up to well, more than n equals 20 would be great. Come on, a couple of other people, can you vote for us? Wonderful. Okay, 15 seconds, counting down. Superb, 23. Keep going, last opportunity. We're about to close the vote. So, yes, yeah, <laughs> vote early and vote often. <laughs> okay, oh, this is great. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We're going to close the vote, and if you can reveal the outcome of the post vote, wow. 52 to 48. The motion passes post-debate by the smallest of margins. So what that says about the debate and what that says about the contributions from the floor, we are going to let you draw your own conclusions. But Anthony, could, could a we fi ask a final comment? I know. I wonder if we could ask people who changed their mind, just like one or two or three people who changed their mind to explain what they've gone through. Can we do that? We can, we can do that for two awesome. minutes. So uh, who's prepared to say, I, ch I ch changed my vote because... Because I think we all come in with our own filters. I am talking about the brain again. <laughs> and we are eager to read the sentence the way we want to read it. So standard assessments, we all have our own pre-context and preconceptions about it. But you just take a look at the sentence itself. Standard assessments, now, future, later, it's quite ambiguous. And learning, who is the learner? Does it actually hinder? No, you need assessments, but in what context, in what culture, how flexible, how deviated, this right and left, that's okay. another debate. Thank you. One other? Okay. I feel for me it was more the point that it's not for assessment themselves, it's how we use them. Thank you. And? So, uh, uh, when I grow up, I'm actually the beneficiary of the uh, standardized assessment, but uh, after I grow up, uh, grow older. I feel uh, a lot of my classmates they uh, they are, are hindered by this uh, uh, standardized assessment. And I believe if they are given enough opportunities, they can uh, definitely uh, explore their potential. And then this will make this world a much different place. Well, colleagues, I want to give you my interpretation, and that is that um, the shift that took place shows that this has actually been a learning experience for us all. And I want you, please, to thank. Patton, Christine, thank you very much. Alina, Ellen, and thank you for coming and participating. Thank you very much.